going to um, uh, hopefully continue on uh, and try to, r- try to rise to the challenge uh, of Dean and the other panelists um, and talk a bit about next steps and talk a bit about research. Uh, we're going to break the mold a bit. Uh, we're going to have uh, two speakers, uh, one eminent scientist joining us from Los Angeles uh, to share her uh, quite fantastic research, uh, which is unlocking the uh, interrelations between cannabis, pain, and opioids. Uh, and then I'll finish up uh, and try and build on the fantastic uh, things we've heard today, uh, talk about some of the work we've done at the BCCSU in the last year, uh, and talk about what our hopes and plans are for the future. Uh, but first, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Ziva Cooper uh, to the stage uh, and to Vancouver. Dr. Cooper is the Research Director of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative and an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. Uh, Her current research is funded by the U.S. National Institutes on Health and the the State of California, uh, and it involves understanding the biological, environmental, and pharmacological variables that influence both the therapeutic potential and the adverse effects of cannabis and cannabinoids using double-blind, placebo-controlled studies. Quite simply, Dr. Cooper is operating at the razor's edge, at the front lines uh, of science around cannabis. She served on the National Academies of Sciences Committee on the Health Effects of Cannabis that recently published a comprehensive consensus report on the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. She is past president of the International Study Group Investigating Drugs as Reinforcers. She's a board director for the College of Problems on Drug Dependence, uh, an associate editor of the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Abuse, and on the uh, editorial boards of several journals, including cannabis and cannabinoid research. So please join me on welcoming Dr. Cooper to the stage. Great. Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Malloy, for the wonderful introduction um, and for inviting me here today. Um, Vancouver is one of my favorite cities, so it's really wonderful to be here. And um, for me, um, as a pharmacologist who did her training in animal models of substance use and now does double-blind placebo-controlled studies in a laboratory, um, today has been a very humbling and inspiring experience hearing from um, courageous people who have lived through the opioid epidemic that um, has fallen upon Vancouver, hearing from community organizers and researchers who are working at the ground level to really make a difference. Um, It's very far from my day-to-day experience where I'm in a laboratory figuring out if people are eligible for a study um, based on you know, health outcomes, um, giving people uh, very controlled doses of drug and looking at specific endpoints. Um, so I really want to thank um, Dr. Malloy and everybody who talked earlier and shared with us their knowledge and experience. For me, this has been one of the most informative couple of hours in the last 10 years. Um, and I'm sure that will, it will impact my research going forward. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> So uh, this is going to be a very, uh, a very um, big shift uh, from what we were hearing about. Um, so again, my background is looking at pharmacology and understanding how drugs impact um, the brain and behavior. Uh, my, my training was looking at animal models of substance use and understanding how you can harness both the therapeutic effects of a drug while mitigating the adverse effects. For the last 10 years, I've been focused on doing double-blind placebo-controlled studies of cannabis and cannabinoids, much in this vein, trying to figure out how you can really maximize the therapeutic potential of these compounds while decreasing the potential negative effects. So I'm honored to be able to share with you some of the research I'm doing here, specifically looking at different cannabis constituents and how they might serve as novel strategies to tackle the opioid epidemic. Unlike previous speakers, what I'll be talking mostly about here today is how cannabis constituents might be helpful in reducing our reliance on opioids for pain relief. Uh, So we know that when somebody goes to a hospital or to a dentist or to a primary care physician and gets prescribed prescription opioids for pain, there's a significant percentage that goes on to using these opioids regularly. And so what we want to do is we want to understand how cannabis and cannabinoids might be able to curtail the both the introduction 
of opioids to help with chronic pain, but also the potential to introduce cannabis and cannabinoids as an alternative to people that are already using opioids for chronic pain and reduce opioid uh, reliance in that population. So my disclosures, I'll be talking about some studies here that are funded by the NIH. Um, it is a misconception that uh, the NIH does not support studies related to cannabis and cannabinoids. I have thankfully worked very hard and been successful in obtaining funding looking at cannabis and cannabinoids for a range of endpoints. Um, but in addition to that, in the past year, I've also served on um, some uh, consulting roles as well as um, the scientific advisory board for a company called FSD Pharma. I will not be talking about any of that research today. So for an overview, um, first I'll touch on promise and potential, which I clearly don't need to talk about here to this audience um, today. We've already heard so much about this. I'll talk about what is known based in the peer review literature. I'll be bringing in preclinical science, so what we know from the animal, from the animal studies um, with respect to cannabis and cannabinoids and their role in helping to reduce our reliance on opioids. And then I'll be talking about my own work and the vision for the future. Um, so again, promise for cannabis in the opioid epidemic. I don't need to put up a bunch of peer-reviewed literature articles here talking about the immense potential that we have heard about for the last couple of hours related to how cannabis and cannabinoids might be helpful um, for people that are struggling with opioid use disorder or for its ability to potentially substitute for opioids for pain. In the U.S., um, we know that there is state-level data supporting decreases in prescription opioid use in states that have laws related to um, medical cannabis, medicinal cannabis, and this has been shown in multiple papers. We know globally there have been reports in the U.S., Canada, Australia, Israel, People have been reporting that when they use medicinal cannabis and they have pain, they're able to reduce their opioid use along with other prescription drugs. And we also know, um, based on the paper that was published last week from Dr. Malloy's lab, that daily cannabis use is negatively associated with, with illicit opioid use, specifically in populations that are dealing with chronic pain. So we know that there is promise here for cannabis. And my question that has been touched on throughout the day in many sessions is when we're talking about cannabis, what exactly are we um, identifying as the potential therapeutic feature of this plant? Um, so this is kind of a cheesy uh, picture of the cannabis plant, and my husband always yells at me and tells me that it's not accurate, but I like it. It has different colors, um, <laughs> and it's pretty. Um, and so we know that there are over 140 unique constituents of the cannabis plant. These are called phytocannabinoids. And up here, I just have five that I think are very interesting. Um, there's a research interest related to these five. Of course, we know a lot about tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, and its therapeutic effects. We also know that it's the component that makes people high and is responsible for impairment when people take too much of cannabis with, with a high amount of THC. There is immense interest in cannabidiol. In the U.S., in Los Angeles specifically, you cannot go to a grocery store. You cannot go to a veterinarian without seeing CBD plaster all over the place. The truth is, is that we actually know very little with respect to double-blind placebo-controlled studies and how cannabidiol might be able to be used therapeutically for a range of symptoms and disease states. There has been some very exciting reports recently looking at cannabidiol specifically for opioid use disorder, and it was shown that pretty high doses of cannabidiol were helpful in curbing the anxiety that is uh, accompanied with uh, cannabis craving, oh, I'm sorry, with opioid craving in opioid-dependent uh, individuals. We also know um, that the cannabis plant has hundreds of other chemicals that are shared with other plants. Um, there's been quite a bit of attention given to, excuse me, given to terpenes. Um, so there's over uh, 100, 200 of these chemicals in the cannabis plant, and it's hypothesized that these individual constituents might also help to improve the therapeutic profile of the cannabis plant, and it might interact with some of those phytocannabinoids that I had on the previous slide. Two terpenes that I'm specifically interested in are beta caryophylline and myrcene um, because it's been shown preclinically that these terpenes um, help to reduce pain in animal populations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. 
So a part of my research is focusing on this idea that is it possible that cannabis and can cannabis constituents, such as these phytocannabinoids and terpenes, could they help to reduce our reliance on opioids and perhaps also reduce the adverse effects associated with opioids? So not only could uh, the cannabis constituents decrease the dose of the opioid needed, but will it also decrease the adverse effects? So what we call abuse liability, the harmful negative effects on the body, the craving, so on and so forth. Um, and so the constituents I'll be talking about today are THC, CBD, cannabidiol, and two specific terpenes. So I'm going to talk about the preclinical data. And when I develop my hypotheses for the studies that I do in my lab, I look very closely at what's happening in the preclinical laboratory as a hint of what might be promising in the clinic and what be, might be promising in the clinical trials. I also pay close attention to what my uh, colleagues who are looking at a community level and publishing based on observational data, what are the current trends? What are people reporting? What are people finding most effective? And when I draw from the animal literature and from what people are reporting in the community, it puts together a really nice rational justification for what I need to look at under very controlled conditions in the laboratory. So based on animal literature, THC, there is ample evidence showing that THC is helpful for pain and animal models of pain. We also know that THC acts with opioids synergistically, meaning that you can give a very low dose of THC, a dose that normally isn't helpful for pain, and a very low dose of an opioid that normally isn't helpful for pain in the animal. And when you put them together, you get robust pain relief. So we know that there's quite a bit of data related to this in the animal literature. With respect to cannabidiol, we don't know quite as much. We do know that cannabidiol in animals does help with certain types of pain. And we also know that unlike THC, cannabidiol has very minimal behavioral effects. Um, so it's not cognitively impairing. It doesn't screw up um, the animal's locomotor activity. The animals don't find it to be rewarding as they would with THC. However, right now there has been very little with respect to understanding if cannabidiol and opioids act synergistically the same way that THC does. So this is an important area that has not yet been chartered, but we're going to learn from some of our community data, from some of the observational data, that we're seeing hints from what people are reporting um, based on their experience with cannabidiol. Interestingly, and this is very relevant with respect to how can cannabis and cannabis constituents help to curb um, uh, uh, some of the variables that might impact development of opioid use disorder um, or opioid craving, there have been animal studies that have shown that cannabidiol can actually decrease abuse-related qualities of opioids. So if you think about it, cannabidiol, which is pain relieving on its own in animals, combined with an opioid, it might actually help to decrease some of those negative effects of the opioid while boosting the pain relieving effects of that opioid. With respect to terpenes, um, as I mentioned before, there's really nice encouraging data that two specific terpenes, myrcene and beta caryophylline, have really robust analgesic effects, pain relieving effects in animal models. And interestingly, you have to go up to 40 times the pain relieving dose to see behavioral impairment in these animal models. So it's a nice signal that terpenes alone, the terpenes in the cannabis plant alone, might actually be effective at promoting pain relief. We also know that beta caryophylline in animals, just like THC, it acts synergistically with opioids so that you just need a very small dose of an opioid to produce significant pain relief. Again, when we look at population level data, and I showed this evidence before, there is numerous papers supporting the potential for cannabis to help alleviate pain and help to alleviate our reliance on opioids. With respect to CBD, I was happy to see that last week there was, to my knowledge, the first paper that looked specifically at cannabidiol-enriched um, cannabinoid ca cannabis preparations in a pain population and found that there was a 50%, 50 percent of that population had a reduction in opioid use or totally eliminated their opioid use. Um, so this was a hint to us showing that, yes, in the community, people are using cannabidiol-enriched 
um, cannabis preparations, and they are able to reduce their opioid use. And uh, uh, I think that the group that actually published this paper, um, looking at how uh, pain patients who use opioids, they gravitate towards types of cannabis that are very high in myrcene and beta caryophylline. And those pain patients, those people with pain, were able to reduce their opioid use. So giving us a hint that in the community, people are using cannabis products that have these high levels of terpenes, and they're successfully coming down, reducing their opioid use. So we have robust preclinical evidence for THC opioid synergy, some hint that cannabidiol and terpenes might act synergistically with opioids, so you can reduce your opioid dose and decrease adverse effects. And based on population levels, it does seem like there is promise for THC, cannabidiol, and terpenes to also reduce our reliance. So how do we fill this gap? We have really nice preclinical findings, and we have really nice um, patient reports and population level data. So here's where we come in. We have a controlled human laboratory where we actually give participants under placebo control conditions different amounts of THC, different amounts of cannabis, different amounts of cannabis constituents, cannabidiol and terpenes, and look at it in interactions with opioids to determine, yes, if you give cannabidiol, if you give myrcene or beta caryophylline, can you actually reduce the opioid dose needed to achieve pain relief? Moreover, is it possible that the abuse-related effects, so maybe the positive subjective effects that accompany opioids, like how much people like the opioid, um, or the cannabis itself, how much people enjoy the cannabis, or how intoxicated are they, is it possible that when you combine these two, can you get a reduction in some of those effects? And that's really important moving forward. If we want to tell people that this might be a very good strategy to increase the pain-relieving effects of the opioid while reducing the negative effects, we want to know a whole host of endpoints, what the, what the effects are of this combination. So again, these are done under a controlled environment. People come into our laboratory. We take away their, I was going to say their iPods, but I don't think anybody has an iPod anymore. We take away their phones so they can't communicate with people throughout the day. They can't talk to their girlfriends or their grandmothers or their mothers and get into any kind of like you know, discussion that might alter their mood. Um, we have, you know, sets of um, reading materials, movies, things that can really um, help to keep them, you know, uh, engaged during the course of the session, but also help us to control what type of stimuli they might be um, responding to. These are double-blind placebo-controlled studies, meaning that people get active drugs. So in the case of cannabis, we're giving them active cannabis, cannabis with THC, versus placebo cannabis, cannabis with no THC. We're looking at both the therapeutic effects, so in this respect, it's pain relief, as well as adverse effects, intoxication. Ultimately, if we're looking at the clinical utility, the helpfulness of cannabis and cannabis constituents, we're hoping that people aren't going to be too high or too impaired, um, because that would impact people's everyday functioning. So we want to look at intoxication. We also want to look at ratings of what we call abuse liability, so how positive of a drug effect they are getting. I should say that in the U.S. and Canada as well, these studies are a regulatory nightmare. Um, I have to apply to several different agencies in order to get approval. I have to get the cannabis and the cannabinoids from a source that is legal, um, so they, they are able to cultivate it and give it to me as a researcher that holds a license to be able to use it. And also, importantly, the FDA has to okay all of my studies. So I can't go to you know, the drugstore down the street that has cannabidiol lotions and do a clinical study with this because the FDA wants to ensure that I know what I'm giving people and um, that uh, it's safe, there aren't pesticides, there aren't mold, and that um, the batches are consistent from batch to batch. So in order to induce pain, to look at pain, this is a healthy population, and I'm bringing people in, and I want to see if these cannabis constituents can help to alleviate pain. I use something very... Um, economically feasible. It's called a cold presser test. Um, and all I do is I ask participants to put their hand in ice cold water for three minutes and tell me when they first feel pain and then when it's no longer bearable to take their hand out. 
Um, it's super easy to do. It's easy to train participants on. It's also not the most expensive thing in the world, which is very nice. And so today I'll be talking about pain threshold, the time that it takes for people to first feel pain when they put their hand in the ice cold water. So a lot of people think, well, this is a test that looks at an acute pain response. Um, and people who are knowledgeable in the cannabis field will say, oh, cannabis isn't good for acute pain. If you're going to the dentist to get your tooth removed, don't try smoking cannabis because it won't help. Um, so what's interesting about this pain model is that even though I'm acutely exposing people to pain repeatedly throughout a session, it actually has what we call predictive validity for therapeutics to help with chronic pain. So drugs that help with chronic pain and patients that have chronic pain, those drugs show a positive signal specifically in this test. Other drugs that help with acute pain, like Advil or Tylenol, actually don't have a positive signal in this test. So that's why we use this test. It looks at, um, it looks at drug treatments that are helpful for chronic pain. And what's nice about this study these studies is that each person is their own control. So everybody has a different pain threshold coming into this, right? But every person gets placebo, so I can look at what their pain response when they get placebo, and all the active medication conditions. So each person, I'm just comparing that person to themselves. Um, so you don't need a very large sample of people for these types of studies. Again, I'm interested in toxication. We want to make sure that we're reducing or that we're not getting um, significant ratings of intoxication or that when we're looking at the combination of these products, we're not getting more intoxication than what we see with each constituent by itself. We also look at positive drug effects. What, what is your desire to take this drug again, this combination of opioid and cannabis or terpene? In some situations, we actually give people an opportunity to what we call self-administer, to be able to take the drug in the laboratory. And that's also a very good measure of what we call abuse liability. So for this particular study that I'll be talking about, um, we looked at a very, uh, uh, well, relative to what people are using in Vancouver and, um, and in Los Angeles, it's a pretty low dose of cannabis here. It's 5.6% THC cannabis. They're smoking about um, 700 grams of it, so they're getting about 35 milligrams of smoked THC. And we're combining this with a very low dose of oxycodone. Um, this is a dose of oxycodone that is not thought to be pain relieving on its own. And again, remember, the idea here is to see if we can boost or if we can look at a synergy between the cannabis and the opioid here. So we're looking at pain relief, intoxication, and abuse liability. So when we look at the combination here, when, you, when, you, when we tested just cannabis by itself and we looked at the rating of pain tolerance compared to placebo, placebo being zero here, we found that cannabis on its own produced some increase in pain tolerance. This wasn't significant compared to placebo, but we saw some increase. As expected, the oxycodone dose did not produce pain relief um, as, you know, Usually when you get oxycodone from a physician, the lowest dose I'll start on is five milligrams. This is two and a half milligrams. When we combine the two together, we got significant increases in pain tolerance, showing that the combination of cannabis and oxycodone in this particular population produced robust um, pain relief. However, as expected, participants did get intoxicated with cannabis alone. Oxycodone did not produce intoxication. The good news is that oxycodone didn't further increase cannabis intoxication. And I should say that um, ratings of, of uh, abuse liability, so positive drug effects, drug liking, wanting to take it again, uh, followed a similar pattern here. We also asked um, patients to participants to tell us how the capsule, how the opioid made them feel. And what we found is that under the cannabis condition by itself, they didn't rate that the opioid made them feel, um, didn't, they didn't like the opioid, they were getting placebo opioid under that condition. The low dose of the opioid didn't produce increased ratings of abuse liability. However, when we put the two together, we did see some increases. And this was concerning to us. It was not what we wanted to find. We were hoping that actually the THC would decrease the abuse liability that we might see with the opioid. Which leads us to our second study, which I'll talk about in a minute. So what we found was that cannabis increases opioid analgesia. So we're able to translate what we see in the animal lab um, to the human lab. 
showing this synergistic effect. So in theory, in the community, in patients, we might be able to reduce the opioid dose by adding cannabis specifically with THC. We did not see an increase in cannabis intoxication or abuse liability, but we also didn't see a decrease, unfortunately. We also saw a modest increase in opioid abuse liability. So what I want to focus on here is this idea of the potential for cannabidiol to actually further increase the pain-relieving effects of the opioid here, and perhaps decrease the intoxicating component that we're seeing. Um, and that's the focus of an ongoing study that we started about a year ago, where we're looking at cannabis with both cannabidiol and THC. Compared to the study that I just showed you, we only looked at cannabis with THC in it, very, very small amounts of cannabidiol. So the second study will be able to look at specifically how cannabidiol might impact the intoxication, the negative effects that we saw here, but maybe boost the pain-relieving effects of THC. We're also hoping to get a study underway looking at these terpenes, myrcene and beta caryophylline to see if we can also further boost um, the opioids' uh, analgesic effects while decreasing abuse liability and intoxication. So, so to summarize, for me, um, I think that assessing uh, these cannabis constituents under controlled conditions, where I can look at very specific doses under very specific procedures, are really important to help bridge what we see in the animal laboratory and what we're hearing from patients and community members. It gives us some guidance to be able to say, yes, these terpenes, beta caryophylline and myrcene, they are really important in understanding the therapeutic effects of cannabis and how they might help opioid use disorder, how they might help to replace opioids for analgesics. And controlled studies are really necessary in order to understand how we can leverage the therapeutic effects of cannabis while also decreasing the negative effects, the adverse effects, such as intoxication, impairment, and abuse liability. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborator, collaborators, study participants, and um, funding. Thank you very much. Um, like Dr. Cooper, I've been humbled and inspired by what I've heard today uh, from the panelists that we've had uh, join us on stage today, from researchers, clinicians, people with lived experience, and our frontline harm reduction providers. Uh, what I'd like to do in the very short time that we have left before lunch is, is to try and sort of add my voice as a scientist uh, to what we've heard today uh, and to talk about some of the work that we're doing uh, at the BCCSU and the work that we hope to do in the very near future. And really what I'd like to do is, is to try and argue for a bit of a rationale, a scientific rationale. Um, uh, to evaluate cannabis, its harms, its pos possible benefits, uh, as an intervention in the ongoing opioid overdose crisis. Uh, before I get there, though, I want to share my disclosures. Uh, I'm fortunate to uh, receive uh, peer-reviewed funding from a number of organizations, including the U.S. National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, CIHR, and Michael Smith. Uh, the university has already received funds from a, a private firm seeking a license to be a cannabis producer. Uh, and as well as, as we've uh, discussed by now, I hold the Canopy Growth Professorship in Cannabis Science, uh, which was uh, funded by arm's-length gifts uh, from Canopy Growth and the Government of British Columbia's Ministry of Mental Health and addictions. Uh, I'm very grateful for all this support, and I do want to emphasize that I have no personal financial relationships uh, with the cannabis industry other than being an occasional consumer. Uh, I also want to respectfully acknowledge that the work, uh, the land on which I work and I live is the territory of the Coast Salish, uh, including the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. We're living through the largest public health crisis of our age, uh, a crisis on the level of HIV, on the level of drunk driving, on the level of tobacco in, in earlier years. Uh, and last year, uh, our government estimates that we lost almost 5,000 of our fellow citizens, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members, uh, to an entirely preventable cause of death, opioid overdose. Uh, and here in British Columbia, we've seen over the last number of years the terrible toll that opioid overdoses has taken at a population level. Uh, it now surpasses suicide, homicide, and motor vehicle accidents combined as a cause of accidental death uh, in our society. Uh, and this is a crisis that we, are shared, unfortunately, that we share, unfortunately, uh, with our neighbors in other parts of Canada uh, and with our cousins south of the border in the United States. We are seeing unprecedented numbers of deaths. In the United States, over 70,000 people lost their lives to opioid overdoses last year. 
The factors are multidimensional, uh, and they are, uh, uh, but in large measure, the primary cause of this uh, crisis uh, is the contamination of our drug supply with fentanyl. Quite simply, the illicit drug supply has been contaminated and poisoned uh, by fentanyl, uh, a novel opioid analog. And the burden of disease, the burden of mortality, is falling most heavily, most heavily on many of the people that we heard from today and their families. People who are marginalized and criminalized because of their drug use, people who are living with substance use disorders, especially opioid use disorder, and people who are living with chronic pain, PTSD, and many of the common comorbidities we see among people living uh, with opioid use disorder. As we've heard as well, one of the contributing factors to this crisis is the failure of our governments uh, to put the evidence-based responses to overdose, overdose in the hands of people that need them when they need them. We have evidence-based responses to either reduce the risk of suffering an overdose or reduce or even eliminate the risk of dying of an opioid overdose. Uh, medications for opioid use disorder like methadone, buprenorphine, naloxone, and other agonist therapies have been shown to reduce the risk of overdose. Giving people, giving community members take-home naloxone kits have been shown to reduce the uh, incidence uh, of, uh, uh, of opioid overdose. Uh, and we have shown in Vancouver how providing people a safe place to use opioids, supervised consumption facilities like, like Insight, uh, virtually eliminate the risk that someone who is overdosing will die of that overdose. Uh, earlier this year, I was part of a team uh, in Vancouver that tried to answer the question, well, just what kind of impact has this has? Uh, Vancouver uh, has a bit of a reputation for being a bit of a leader in providing harm reduction services, but the real conclusion from this paper was that we need to do far more to save the lives of our fellow citizens. Uh, and basically what we did in this paper is we tried to come up with an estimate uh, for how many deaths were averted and how many deaths were, uh, so how many deaths were averted by providing these three interventions, take-home naloxone, supervised consumption sites, and opioid agonist therapy, primarily in the downtown east side and in other populations and communities heavily affected by drug use. And we concluded that between April 2016, the real the beginning of the crisis, uh, and December 2017, there were over 2,000 deaths from overdose in our province. Uh, and these interventions, uh, combined, estimated, uh, saved over 3,000 lives, which is great news. But for me, the take-home message is that we, f we failed to save the lives of over 2,000 individuals. And so clearly, as scientists, as public health professionals, uh, and as citizens, we need to do more uh, to save lives uh, during this crisis. Uh, and as we've heard today, and I, I'll try not to belabor the point, uh, cannabis uh, in the minds of many of us, scientists, community members alike, uh, could be one of those interventions to save lives. Uh, Dr. Cooper and others have sort of talked about some of the early preliminary research uh, that we've seen largely from south of the border, which have identified important benefits associated with states that have legal access to cannabis, uh, often through medical cannabis systems. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to the bar on the far right. Uh, and basically that paper showed that states with some form of legal access to medical cannabis had per, uh, approximately 25% lower rates of opioid overdose mortality compared to states without some form of legal access. Why might that be? Well, as we've heard as well, time and time again, uh, medical cannabis patients tell us that using cannabis, they can reduce or even eliminate uh, the opioids that they are using for chronic pain and other reasons. Uh, Benke uh, in 2016 showed that among about 240 clients of a medical, dispens medical cannabis dispensary, uh, a majority, almost two-thirds, reported decreases in their opioid, in their opioid use. Uh, and Andrea Ryman's group down in California showed that almost all of the medical cannabis patients uh, in that dispensary who were using opioids, almost all of them said they could or did reduce the amount of opioids that they're using. So we have good preliminary data, and Dr. Cooper as well has talked about the plausibility of this data uh, from studies uh, in humans and in animals describing the links between cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. But what we really need uh, on the ground is observational data uh, from individuals at the highest risk of overdose to understand better what the possible risks and benefits of cannabis might be. So we're very fortunate in Vancouver that we've been doing work like this for many years. And since 1996, in fact, uh, we've operated three studies of people at very high risk of overdose, uh, most living in the downtown east side, but other folks uh, living in the downtown south. 
Uh, these three studies are the Vancouver Injection Drug User Study, which involves 1,500 people who inject drugs in the downtown east side. Uh, it's the at-risk youth study, which involves about a 1,000 street-involved youth who use illicit drugs. And we heard from Scarlett, one of the participants, who eloquently talked about her cannabis use. And then the AIDS care cohort to evaluate exposure to survival services, which is about 1,000 people uh, who use drugs in the downtown east side who are living with HIV. How do these cohorts work? We basically recruit folks uh, who are using drugs and we follow them over time. Uh, every six months, they complete a very lengthy face-to-face -face interview with our, with our trained interviewers, uh, and they're examined by one of our study nurses who collect blood and urine for further testing. Uh, and these interviews are a gold mine of really crucial data to tell us uh, about individuals' drug use patterns, about their engagement in health care, about the many social and structural determinants of health, like housing and violence, uh, criminal uh, engagement in the criminal justice system, and the like. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that we've been successful uh, in the traditional scientific metrics about how many people we've recruited and how many interviews we've done and what kind of journals we've published in. But most importantly, uh, we've managed to generate important evidence uh, to advance things like HIV prevention and care, to advance addiction medicine, to advance harm reduction and supervised consumption facilities, and to advance the human rights uh, of people who use drugs in our community. And in the last number of years, we've turned our attention to cannabis and to try and figure out what role cannabis might play uh, among this group of individuals. The first thing we've learned uh, is that cannabis use is very common uh, among people who use drugs who are at the highest risk of overdose. Uh, at their last interview, more than half told us that they, that they used cannabis at least once. And among those people, about 40% told us that they were using cannabis every day, often smoked cannabis. And when we asked them why they were using cannabis, recreation was the most important reason. Um, but over 75% of those cannabis users also told us that they were using cannabis for at least one therapeutic reason, to address pain, to improve sleep, or to deal with withdrawal. We've also found that many people who are using drugs are using cannabis intentionally for harm reduction, uh, and in many cases to try and reduce their risk of other more risky substances. Uh, here is uh, a transcript from an interview collected by one of my qualitative colleagues. Uh, this is a person in the at-risk youth study, uh, a white male, age 30, uh, who said, pot is major harm reduction for me. I come home from work, I buy the things I need for my place, I get high, and I enjoy the high for about three or four hours, and then go to sleep, you know. It actually works. It keeps me away from the crack. And most notably, we've managed to replicate that experience uh, in a study that was led by my friend and colleague, Dr. Eugenio Susias. And in this study, what we did is we looked at about 122 people who were using drugs, uh, and they told us you know, over a course of about 620 interviews uh, how they were intentionally using cannabis uh, to reduce their cr frequency of crack cocaine use. Uh, and what we found was that a period of that intentional cannabis use to reduce crack use was associated later on with a decreased frequency of crack use in subsequent periods. Now, I, I want to emphasize that we cannot conclude that there's a cause and effect here, uh, and that these sorts of observational studies does not allow us to conclude that what we're seeing is cause and effect. But I think what's most notable is that there are individuals who have developed ad hoc strategies to try and deal with their crack cocaine use, to try and deal with their health and well-being by employing cannabis. So we've also found in our studies a number of very important uh, statistical associations, correlations between cannabis use and various drug-related benefits. Recently, we showed in that at-risk youth study that far from cannabis being a gateway to more risky forms of drug use, in fact, uh, youth who had yet to begin injecting drugs when they were using cannabis every day, they were far less likely to begin injecting drugs. We also found using data from urine drug screens that individuals with some evidence of cannabis use with THC positive urine were far less likely to have a urine that was positive for fentanyl. Now, this might be because individuals were successfully substituting cannabis for opioids. It might be for other reasons, but certainly in the midst uh, of an overdose crisis driven by fentanyl, uh, these were very encouraging results. Uh, we also found in another excellent paper uh, 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 led by my uh, colleague, Dr. Sosias, that people starting treatment for opioid, uh, for opioid use disorder, if they were using cannabis at least once a day, uh, they had statistically better engagement in therapy. They were more likely to still be on opioid use disorder therapy uh, at six months.
Uh, and most notably, I think, is a study that we published uh, last week, which was a very large study, probably the largest study of its kind, uh, which followed over 11, almost 1,200 people who used drugs, largely from the downtown east side, uh, over the course of over 5,000 interviews. Uh, and these were all folks who at one point or another told us that they were living with chronic pain. Uh, and we found uh, that in a statistical model which was adjusted for many uh, important factors, that those people using cannabis at least once a day uh, were far less likely to use illicit opioids uh, every day. Again, we can't conclude that there's a cause and effect relationship here. It may be that statistical association may be the result uh, of other things, uh, but it's very encouraging for us as we try to understand what the possible health benefits of cannabis use might be uh, at people at risk uh, of overdose. So what have we found? We found cannabis use is very common and it might come with some therapeutic intentions. It might also have specific benefits, especially for those who are at risk of beginning to inject, those who are starting treatment for opioid use disorder, and those who are living with chronic pain. And maybe most encouragingly, and I think this is backed up by research that Dr. Co or it's consistent with research that Dr. Cooper has done and others, including Dr. Walsh and Dr. Uh, almost Dr. Lucas, that their cannabis might allow individuals to mitigate the frequency of illicit opioid use. It might allow them to substitute cannabis for opioids, thereby reducing their risk of exposure to illegal molecules uh, and dangerous molecules like fentanyl, and thereby mitigate or change their, modulate their risk of overdose. Now, as I've said and I've tried to uh, emphasize, we cannot conclude that our findings are cause and effect. There are obviously errors that are uh, a, par a part of all scientific research, including ours. We might be dealing with the fact that some individuals, uh, 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 as are any individuals, might have problems with their memory, uh, might, be, um, uh, 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 might not want to tell us about their drug use, uh, but we found that these reports are valid and useful in the past. We especially, as Dr. Cooper has underlined, need more data on what are the constituents of the cannabis that these individuals are using. Uh, is the, are, are these THC predominant strains? Are these CBD predominant strains? And more crucially, what might people be using to guarantee these results? Uh, we've heard today very much about the possible benefits of high-dose edibles, and we're very interested to see what role those, that, uh, those edibles have in the health and well-being of our participants. And of course, we also need to talk about risks. Uh, no psychoactive drug comes without risks. And, and certainly the issue of dependence uh, and abuse uh, is certainly that we must be uh, uh, very mindful of. Because of these limitations of our current work, uh, and, because of us, and because of the deep need and the urgent need for us to come up with answers about the questions about the possible role of cannabis uh, in the lives and the health of these individuals, uh, I'm very pleased to announce today for the first time uh, the next steps that we're taking. Uh, and over the next year or so, we hope to begin uh, recruiting individuals into controlled trials of cannabis uh, to try and understand uh, the role and the effects of the cannabis use on people with highest risk of overdose. Uh, we're going to be calling these trials the Generalizable Experiments in Medical Marijuana and Addiction. Um, and I'm very uh, grateful to Karma and her family uh, for allowing us to use Gemma's name uh, in this work. These are going to be pilot trials. Uh, some of these trials will be very clinically focused as we try and understand what role cannabis might play for people who are engaged in treatment for opioid use disorder. Quite simply, if we pair cannabis with methadone, do we improve outcomes for methadone? This is a urgent question which would have obvious benefits as we seek to uh, 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 prevent overdose deaths. But we also think it's important to uh, work with individuals who are not engaged in clinical medicine, individuals who are looking at cannabis as harm reduction in community settings. And basically what we want to do in all of this work is try to replicate the benefits that we've already seen in observational trials. So some of the outcomes we, we might want to look at are things like exposure to fentanyl. Uh, engagement and treatment for opioid use disorder, use of illicit opioids, pain, quality of life, all of the important outcomes for people uh, who are living with uh, uh, the risk of overdose. We are very cognizant of wanting to maximize the impact of this research and this evidence on clinical practice, on government policy, and on local policy. So we are taking some steps uh, to really uh, maximize the rigor and the transparency of the work as we move forward. Uh, I'm happy to emphasize that these are investigator-initiated trials using funds that have already been given to the university. Uh, in other words, 
private uh, corporations will have no influence over the work that we do, uh, which is very important from a transparency uh, point of view. Uh, I'm also proud to say that we're beginning uh, to recruit individuals to an advisory board who will oversee all of our work, who will make sure that it is acceptable to the community and that it is answering the questions that community members, people with living experience, clinicians want to have answered. Uh, and I'm also very proud to say that, uh, that Karma uh, is the first person to accept my invitation to the board. Uh, I look forward to working with her and her family, uh, and I look forward to working with many other people that you've heard from today. Uh, and what we'll do, quite simply, is what we did in the uh, supervised injection facility um, evaluation. We will submit all of our trial designs, all of our methodology, and all of our results to peer review to ensure that we live up to the highest possible standard of evidence and science. Uh, because we believe that is how we're going to move things forward. Uh, and we believe that's how we're going to maximize the possible benefits of cannabis and minimize the possible risks uh, for the uh, individuals and community members among us at highest risk of overdose. So uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming today. I want to thank with some acknowledgments, not only of my team and the people that I work with at the BC Center on Substance Use, uh, but I also want to take this opportunity as today's MC, uh, the Hulk Hogan of today's uh, work, I think, uh, Dr. Bluthenthal <laughs> called me. It's going to be interesting uh, to thank many of the people uh, who uh, brought today together, in particular Kevin Hollett, the BCCSU, Lisa Slater, Ophelia Yu, and Elisa Tam at UBC, uh, and Chris, Ma uh, Chris Murray at Canopy. Uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Bluthenthal, who did a fantastic job, and the other panelists and moderators uh, who also did a wonderful job sharing everything with us. I also, of course, want to again thank Karma and her family uh, for being a part of this work, and of course, Dr. Mark Ware and Hilary Black for their uh, unstinting support of the work that we do. And I want to thank all of you for turning out, uh, for paying attention, uh, and for adding to the, the, the day that we've had. So thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll take some more questions, uh, and then we'll break for lunch. <laughs>